Hello everyone, a very good morning and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. Before we begin, we have a very important and an exciting announcement. After having delivered successful results year on year, we are planning to launch a free trial access so that all of you can access our courses on the Baiju's exam prep app completely free of cost for three days starting from the 14th of July. All you have to do is register by using the pinned comment but the link provided in the pinned comment below. Essentially, you'll be able to access all the live classes, the recorded lectures, including subject-based quiz on the Baiju's exam prep app. This will be absolutely free of cost for all the students for a period of three days. So you get to cover the essential topics. All you have to do is register using the link provided in the pinned comment. With this, let's proceed with the discussion. Let's take a look at the topics we are going to discuss today. I have chosen important articles from page number 10 and 12 for a detailed analysis and discussion along with few smaller articles that are more relevant for the prelims examination. So let's take a look at these articles one by one and analyze the topics in complete detail. We shall begin with an important column on page number 10 that deals with a recent judgment passed by the Allahabad High Court with regard to live-in relationships in India. This topic, which is from Indian polity, deals with few fundamental rights. It deals with personal relations and the role of the state in controlling and regulating personal affairs and personal relations. First, let's understand what is the context? Why is the topic in news? Recently, in the Kiran Rawat case, the Allahabad High Court has passed a very controversial judgment. This case involved an interfaith couple who were in a live-in relationship. It involved a man and a woman in their uh, 30s, their age, they were above 30 years of age. So this man and woman, they belonged to different faiths, they were from different communities and they were in love. They were living together as an unmarried couple but constantly they were facing harassment from the police based on a complaint that was filed by a family member. Generally when it comes to love, relationships, marriages in India or in any traditional orthodox society, family tends to be a huge problem and a hurdle where traditional orthodox values and morals are being enforced in such societies, families can play an obstructive role in exercising your basic rights, in exercising your personal rights. Based on this complaint filed by a family member, the police, the local police, they were harassing this interfaith live-in couple. So they had approached the Allahabad High Court asking for protection from this police harassment. This was the Kiran Rawat case. In this case, the Allahabad High Court has delivered a judgment. It has declined the appeal made by the couple. It has refused to offer protection from the harassment that the couple were facing. And essentially, it has taken a stand against live-in relationships. So this case has attracted national attention because of the controversial nature of the judgment that has been passed by the Allahabad High Court. Also, the observations made by the judiciary also has come into question and criticism. So in this context, we should understand what exactly is a live-in relationship. What is the legal validity of it? How does it compare with marriage? What constitutional protections are there for interfaith couples and live-in couples? What are the previous Supreme Court verdicts and interpretations in this regard? And whether the Allahabad High Court was right in its judgment. So we have to carry out a critical analysis of this important topic. It deals with polity and even with social issues as well. The Allahabad High Court has implied that live-in relations are a social problem. The judgment essentially negates the very idea of constitutional morality when it comes to personal relations. See, under the Indian constitution, which is rooted in the principles of liberty, 
equality, etc. The Supreme Court has repeatedly clarified that the state has no business in interfering in personal matters. When it comes to matters of love, marriage, relationship, etc. As far as the personal relations are concerned, as long as it is not violating any law, any established constitutional law, the state has no business to interfere in your personal affairs. This is a part of your right to life that is guaranteed under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, which is a guaranteed fundamental right. Through various judgments, the Supreme Court has repeatedly ruled that right to marriage in itself is a fundamental right under Article 21. The right to love someone, the right to cohabit with someone who, that you like, the right to live in with a person that you like, irrespective of their caste, irrespective of their religion, irrespective of their gender as well. This is a fundamentally guaranteed right under the Indian Constitution and the Supreme Court has repeatedly upheld this interpretation. While this being the case, the judgment of the Allahabad High Court definitely raises concern and some serious questions. So first let's understand what exactly do we mean by a live-in relationship. Given that live-in relationship has become more acceptable, it has become quite the norm at least in urban India, UPSC might dwell into the topic from a society point of view with regard to social issues or even from a legal point of view. A live-in relationship is essentially where a couple, right, irrespective of their caste, religion or even gender, decide to cohabit, meaning they decide to live in the same home, in the same house as a couple. This relationship comes with no strings attached. It does not come with the strings of a marriage, it does not come with the obligations, the legal social obligations that come along with a marriage. Because a marriage, a matrimonial bond, which is legally recognized and socially accepted, comes with its own set of legal and social obligations. With regard to, let's say, having children, then inheritance, divorce, etc. There are laws and social traditions that define a marriage, which is seen as a sacred bond between a married couple. But in case of a live-in relationship, there are no strings attached. You don't have these obligations because a couple have decided to cohabit based on their mutual understanding, mutual love for each other. Such a relationship could be of any form. It could be a sexual relationship. It could be a relationship where there is a strong emotional bond and friendship involved. So cohabitation and live-in relations need not be of a sexual nature. Is that clear? Generally, there is an assumption that live-in relations are always of a sexual nature. Of course, that could be one of the aspects, but cohabitation could be much more than that. It could be a couple who are of the same mindset, who like each other, who cohabit the space. They draw emotional support from each other. They share a bond of friendship. And of course, it could involve a sexual angle as well. Now, this right to cohabit, has been recognized by the Supreme Court through various judgments. So in this regard, the Indian law is not very clear. We don't have a clear legal framework in this regard. There is no specific legal validity that is given to live-in relationships in the country. Because traditionally, the Indian society being a more conservative and orthodox society has, find it, has found it difficult to accept live-in relationships. Usually live-in couples are looked down upon. They find it very difficult to get a space for rent. They find it very difficult to get acceptance from their family members. That's why most live-in couples, they hide their relationship as well. But as long as they are above the legal consent age for marriage, as long as it's a consensual relationship, and as long as both the individuals are of sound mental health, no one has a right to question them, nor, not the state, not the family members, neither the court, nor the law. This is the very essence of personal relations as adjudicated under Indian constitutional law. And the Supreme Court has repeatedly upheld this validity. Yes, marriage is a, a Solomon bond 
which has legal, social validity and recognition. But doesn't mean that live-in relations have to be treated as illegal or live-in relations have to be looked down upon. The Supreme Court has at various instances made it clear that this is a matter of personal liberty. This is a matter of right to life. The right to choose your partner, to live with them, even without marriage. If both the partners have agreed to it, if that is what they've entered into the relationship with, then it's up to them to decide what would be the terms of their cohabitation. Right? So if you look at the legality of living relations in India, until 1978, it was considered as void ab initio. Legally, it means void from the beginning. Until 1978, live-in relations in India were considered as illegal and void from the very beginning itself. But in 1978, the Supreme Court delivered a very important judgment. This judgment was passed in the Badri Prasad case of 1978. Through the Badri Prasad judgment, the Supreme Court for the first time recognized live-in relations. And as long as the couple are mentally sound, as long as they meet the legal age for marriage, which is above 18 years, and if there is consent from both the partners, if these three criteria are met, then any couple, irrespective of their faith or caste, etc., they could enter into a live-in relationship. Even though there is no law recognizing it, there is no legal validity given to it. The Supreme Court through its interpretation made it legal. Is that clear? Essentially, it's not illegal per se. That is the interpretation the Supreme Court came out with in the Badri Prasad case. Now, if you compare a live-in relationship with marriage, of course, there are differences. I told you that right to marriage in India is a fundamental right. It is seen as part of your right to life and personal liberty as interpreted under Article 21 of the Constitution. Any adult of sound mind, they have a choice, they have a right to choose their partner. They need not be forced by their family, by their parents, nor by the society, nor by the government, nor by law to choose their partner. When it comes to marriage, there are several laws that govern the matrimonial relationship right that provides for legal and social validity and defines the obligations as well we have different religion based personal laws like hindu marriage act the muslim personal law etc applying for various religions you also have the special marriage act which accounts for interfaith marriages as well so in a marriage there are certain rights and duties that are accorded and placed upon the couple with regard to divorce, inheritance, then legal recognition for the child that will be born out of wedlock. There are provisions that are defined under these personal codes or personal laws that are present. Of course, you can't directly apply them for a live-in couple, right? But a live-in relationship which does involve premarital sex, right? It is socially looked down upon from the conservative sections of the society. Such a couple could face discrimination as well, which is a breach of their fundamental rights. And yeah, let's say if they have a child outside of marriage, let's say a child is born out of wedlock for a live-in couple. Then what about the rights of the child? Will the child have legal legitimacy? Will the child enjoy the right to inheritance, the right to property? Right? This question was addressed again by the Supreme Court. There is no specific law here again. The government, the legislature have failed to bring out legal provisions regarding this. So Supreme Court through various cases and interpretations has provided legal validity to all these issues concerning a live-in relationship. The Supreme Court has recognized that such a child born to a live-in couple is a legitimate child. The child will have all legal rights similar to the rights enjoyed by a child born out of marriage. This includes right to inheritance and right to property as well. 
so through such interpretations the supreme court has consistently upheld personal liberty when it comes to personal relations this is a constitutional adjudication that the supreme court has come out with repeatedly through various cases this is not simply a moral judgment it's not about judging whether live-in relationships are good or bad right it's not going into that subjectivity supreme court has laid down a very objective legal constitutional principle that personal relations are a matter of personal liberty the state the law the judiciary the family they have no business to interfere in personal relations this jurisprudence has been very clearly established with the supreme court now if you look at the indra sharma case of 2013 this is seen as a landmark judgment in the indra sharma case the supreme court not just recognized live-in couples but also extended the protection of domestic violence act in order to protect women in live-in relations who might be the victims of domestic violence because the protection of women against domestic violence act of 2005 applied only for a married woman now what if in a live-in relationship if a woman is facing domestic violence and abuse by the other partner they did not have any legal recognition and they couldn't claim protection under the law so in the indra sharma case the supreme court expanded the mandate even a woman in a live-in relationship can seek protection under section 2 clause f of the domestic violence act thereby providing further legal validity for live-in relations and thus recognizing the basic rights of couples who are in a live-in relationship now despite this precedent that the supreme court has established the allahabad high court has gone against the established norms and guidelines that is where the concern comes up if you look at the judgment that has been passed it becomes very clear that Allahabad High Court has been very subjective in this judgment. It has made moral judgments when the court shouldn't be getting into this. Essentially, what the Allahabad High Court has done, according to the writer, is that it is unacceptable in a constitutional sense. See, we don't live in medieval times. We don't live in a orthodox society governed just by religion tradition etc we live in a modern civilized democracy where the constitution and the law of the land defines your rights so in previous judgments the supreme court has given for a very progressive liberal interpretation but the allahabad high court is trying to take us back by many decades and centuries this is again not just an opinion of the writer this is based on a sound argument that the writer is making the writer is pointing out why the Allahabad High Court is wrong. There are three grounds on which the mistakes can be pointed out. First, the Allahabad High Court has been carried away by social morality, by outdated orthodox social religious principles, rather than being driven by constitutional principles, rather than upholding personal liberty, Allahabad High Court is seen to be upholding social morality. This is the first problem with the judgment. Second, the Allahabad High Court, even though it has referred to previous Supreme Court judgments, it has essentially ignored the precedent value of these previous judgments. In the Badri Prasad case, Supreme Court clearly recognized that live-in relations are not illegal. In Indra Sarma case, further legal rights were extended to a live-in couple. There are many such judgments in the past Allahabad High Court has conveniently ignored the essence of these judgments. This in itself is a breach of Article 141. Why? Because Article 141 mandates that orders of the Supreme Court are binding on the High Courts. High Courts cannot violate them. Even where precedent has been set by the Supreme Court, where legal interpretations and constitutional interpretations have been given, they have to be abided by the High Court. So Allahabad High Court is seen to be in breach of Article 141 here as it has not taken into consideration the previous verdicts of the Supreme Court. 
and finally Allahabad High Court has relied upon personal laws and religious laws and traditions while passing this judgment. Let me tell you what exactly the judgment was referring to. The judgment does talk about the previous cases including the Velu Swami case, Indra Sarma case, Danulal case where Supreme Court had clearly recognized that live-in relations are not illegal. Here the High Court has said, the Alabad High Court has said that traditionally laws and social traditions, they favor marriage, not live-in relations. And it has concluded that Supreme Court verdicts, they were not intended to promote live-in relations. This is the subjective interpretation of the Allahabad High Court. Even when Supreme Court had passed a constitutional adjudication and it had stayed away from any moral judgment on live-in relations, Allahabad High Court has said that previous verdicts, they seem to they seem to provide for more promotion and encouragement to live-in relations. And it has interpreted that that was not the intention of the Supreme Court. It has also said that laws in India and traditions, traditions in India, they are biased in favor of marriage only, giving validity only to marriages and not to live-in relations. This clearly is a subjective opinion of the judge. This brings in subjectivity. It's a moral judgment which is being made, which the judiciary shouldn't be doing. Judiciary should only be guided by constitutional principles and established law of the land. If Supreme Court had already set the precedent, the Alabad High Court had no business to go away or break away from this path. The High Court has essentially rejected the presidential value, the presidential value of the previous Supreme Court verdicts. It has also made unnecessary references to other legal provisions like the CRPC. Under the Criminal Procedure Code, with regard to domestic violence, protection is given only to married women, to wives. When it comes to maintenance provided by a husband to a wife, which is defined under CRPC, right? it provides for a very limited definition that maintenance is given only to married women, that is to wives. So here, the Alabad High Court has made an unnecessary re reference. That when CRPC is providing maintenance only to wives, how can live-in couples claim maintenance? Such unnecessary legal references have been made. And more importantly, Allahabad High Court has shown its orthodox inclination by passing judgments on extramarital sex and premarital sex. It has said that in religious personal laws, be it under Hindu personal laws or Muslim personal laws or Christian personal laws, premarital sex is not recognized and encouraged. Right? In fact, in the society, traditionally, premarital sex is looked down upon. Such orthodox conservative principles have been relied upon by the Allahabad High Court while passing this judgment. It has said that in a live-in relationship, there could be premarital sex involved, extramarital sex involved, and this is not recognizable in Indian society and tradition. That is what the Allahabad High Court is opining. And this is completely unacceptable in a constitutional sense because the Supreme Court has made it very, very clear that personal relations, as long as it is meeting certain basic criteria, it's not the business of the courts or the government or the family or even the society. Clear? This is where the judgment has been heavily criticized. The judgment is showing the orthodoxy that has driven the judiciary, the Allahabad High Court, right? It seems to assume that marriage is a condition to enjoy fundamental rights. That's not the case. You stand to enjoy your fundamental rights even without getting into a marriage. Even in a live-in relationship, the couple have every right to enjoy their fundamental rights. Marriage is not a precondition. There is a clear inclination in this judgment towards social orthodoxy and religious revivalism and conservative values and traditions. This is not something that defines a progressive liberal modern society. right? The Supreme Court has put in a lot of effort to ensure that India is put on the path of progressive libertarian values.
the Alabad High Court has simply reiterated these orthodox beliefs and it's in breach of Article 141 as it has not followed the previous precedent set by the Supreme Court. It has also failed to uphold personal liberty. There are many other judgments where Supreme Court has always prioritized personal liberty. Look at the landmark Joseph Schein case in which adultery was decriminalized under Section 497 of IPC. In this judgment, while decriminalizing adultery, the Supreme Court was very clear that fidelity or loyalty in a relationship is a value. It's not something that can be policed by the state. The government, the police cannot enforce loyalty on a couple. Loyalty within a relationship, fidelity within a relationship, it's a value, it's a virtue at a personal level. It's not something that the state should look into. State police powers were curbed when it comes to punishing moral aberrations. Adultery might be morally wrong. It need not be legally wrong. It need not be a criminal offense. That is what the Supreme Court opined in the Joseph, Joseph Shine case of 2018. Look at another landmark judgment, the Navtej Singh Johar case of 2018, when homosexuality was decriminalized under Section 377 of the IPC. In this judgment as well, the Supreme Court was making a constitutional adjudication, keeping the principles of liberty and equality in mind keeping the principles of Article 21 in mind, not passing moral judgments and not relying on social traditions and orthodoxy. Correct? So the libertarian value of all these judgments is that state's power should be limited in the domain of personal relations and personal choices. That is the underlying argument. The Allahabad High Court seems to have breached this. Look at the Lata Singh case of 2006. In this judgment, the Supreme Court had directed police across the country to protect inter-caste, inter-faith couples from any harassment. Is that clear? This was a precedent set by the Supreme Court. In the S. Kushbu case of 2010, Supreme Court had clearly passed an important observation regarding sexual relations outside of marriage. As long as it is consensual, as long as it is between consenting adults who are of sound mental health, the state, society and family have no business to interfere. This precedent has been very clearly set by the Supreme Court and yet the Allahabad High Court has gone against it. So that is why this judgment is so important. It has grabbed national attention because this is a matter of your personal liberty, which is a fundamental right. All right. So these are the key arguments you need to understand from this important topic. Now, moving on. Let's look at this editorial from page number 10 that evaluates the recent GST council meeting. On Tuesday, a couple of days ago, the 50th GST council meeting took place and some important decisions have been taken with regard to GST rates in the country and the GST policy in the country. So let's evaluate these decisions and let's also understand what is the GST council. It's an important topic for your prelims, right? You can expect a direct factual question on the GST council itself. And let's also look at the recent decisions of the 50th GST council meeting. See through the 122nd amendment bill, which was enacted in 2016, the parliament brought out the 101st constitutional amendment that introduced GST, goods and services tax, which is a type of indirect tax providing for a one nation, one tax system, at least as far as indirect taxes are concerned. Because prior to GST, we had multiple indirect taxes levied by center and state. It was always leading to more confusion, reduced tax collection, and to simplify this, the GST was introduced, which is a global norm as well, right? A single unified indirect taxation system where the revenue would be shared by the center and the states. So as GST was introduced, once the 101st constitutional amendment was enacted by the parliament, it was ratified by more than half the states, which is a constitutional requirement. Following which the presidential assent was provided 
which led to the implementation of the GST regime. To decide the GST rates, to decide the various taxation rates and the tax labs for different goods and services, the GST council was established. The GST council has constitutional backing, it has constitutional status under Article 279A Clause 1. It is established through the President of India as per provisions of Article 279A and it is headed by the Union Finance Minister as the chairperson. Is that clear? The composition of the council is very important. It is headed by the Union Finance Minister along with the Minister of State for Finance at the central government. It also includes finance ministers of all the state governments or any concerned minister appointed by the state government. Understood? So it symbolizes center state financial relations. Since GST introduced a landmark change in terms of taxation and financial relations between center and state, the GST council was set up for this purpose to smoothen the relations between the center and the state. To allow center and state to have a common platform where they could discuss the issues address mutual concerns and provide for a unified indirect taxation system. In fact, states were supposed to suffer losses in the initial years because of implementation of GST because they would lose some of the indirect revenue. So a commitment was made to compensate the states to provide compensation from the center to the state suffering losses because of GST implementation. This compensation mechanism the devolution of these funds would also be handled and decided by the GST council. Is that clear? So the functions of this council according to article 279 includes making recommendations to the union and state governments regarding GST laws, regarding GST to be implemented on various goods and services and fixing the various tax rate slabs under the GST structure. So GST council decides upon how different goods and services are classified and categorized. What taxation is imposed on different goods and services. How are the slab rates organized? And all other taxation matters related to GST are handled by the GST council. So this is the role and the significance of the GST council. The council meets regularly and recently the 50th council meeting has taken place. During the 50th GST Council meeting, there have been a lot of positive outcomes. It has ironed out some of the pressing issues that were present for many years. It has resolved some of the challenges and pressing issues that were present. But now the key lies in execution. If the decisions are well executed and implemented, it will provide for better implementation of GST. It has definitely addressed some of the pressing issues and pending and delayed issues that were there. For example, the establishment of appellate tribunals was one unresolved issue. Because with regard to implementation of GST, there would be a lot of litigations that will come up. There will be a lot of disputes, tax related disputes between the industry and the government. To resolve these litigations and disputes, if industry approaches the regular judiciary, it's going to take a lot of time. Because in the judiciary, you already have a huge backlog of cases. Plus also in matters of taxation, you need certain expertise, you need some specialization as well. And you have to fast track these cases to ensure that businesses are not harmed because of the implementation of GST. That is why specialized tribunals, appellate tribunals are set up. So finally, the GST council has agreed with regard to the composition and the appointment norms for the tribunal members. The appointment norms have been cleared for the tribunal members and states have proposed that 50 appellate tribunals will come up at state capitals and wherever high court benches are present. This will be done in a phased manner across the country and the first set of tribunals should start functioning in the next four to six months according to the GST council. The center and states have finally resolved this issue and they have agreed to set up these appellate tribunals and the norms for appointment of the members has been cleared and the cities has, have been chosen as well. State capitals and all cities where high court benches are present 
So there, the appellate tribunals will come up where the industry can hope for quicker resolution of the GST litigations that are pending. This is one positive development. The other big development is the decision to impose 28% flat GST on all the bets placed in online gaming, casinos and horse racing. These services involve an element of gambling. There has always been moral, legal and social concerns that have been raised about casinos, online gaming and horse racing. This industry is now being taxed heavily with a 28% flat levy on all the bets that are placed. Not on the profits, but on all the bets that are placed. Essentially, a very high barrier is being set to those who want to make these bets in online gaming or in casinos or in horse racing. Now this recommendation, this decision which has been taken, it has generated a lot of controversy as well. Because the industry has obviously opposed it. The online gaming industry, the casino industry, they are deeply concerned because this could completely destroy the industry. They are saying that this is the death knell of online gaming in India and casinos in India. Because with such a high barrier, high taxation barrier, people will not be incentivized to enter into these games. And this could destroy these businesses which are booming in India. I'm sure all of you would have seen there are so many online games which involve an element of gambling. Right? You have your fantasy sport leagues and various betting applications. And there are physical casinos across India, especially in states like Goa and Sikkim. Small states like Goa and Sikkim are heavily dependent on casino driven tourism revenue. Despite all these concerns, the government has taken the decision, the GST council has taken the decision considering the moral, social and legal concerns. This is not a hasty decision. Considerable thought has gone into it. The ministerial group within the GST council has debated this issue at least twice since 2020. After enough deliberate deliberation, the GST Council has decided that heavy taxes have to be imposed to regulate these speculative gaming industries. Is that clear? That is a big decision which has been taken. Now the topic is important because online gaming is being regulated by the Ministry of Electronics and IT under the IT rules. The Electronics and IT Ministry has already brought online gaming under the regulation of IT rules and in the upcoming digital data protection bill online gaming will also be included along with social media firms digital media and OTT platforms right so given this there should be some harmony some synchronization that should be created between the regulation of online gaming and the taxation on online gaming that fine tuning is required following a thorough review from the government all right and finally Lot of pending issues have been resolved during the 50th GST Council meeting. There were some issues pending from many years with regard to classification of certain goods and items and services. There was no clarity. This clarity has been provided. Some tax exemptions and tax rates have been clarified. There were some incongruencies in tax payments and in tax imposition on certain category of goods and services. This confusion has been finally cleared after six years of delay. This is definitely a good development and even several essential drugs, life saving drugs used to treat cancer and rare diseases. They have been exempted. This hadn't been done before. Then large sport utility vehicles, SUVs, which contribute to more traffic and pollution. They are being brought under a higher GST bracket which is a correct policy given the traffic problems in India, given the higher emissions. It's important to disincentivize large SUVs and higher GST has been finally levied. And that's another positive development to come out of the 50th GST council meeting. But however, other pending issues like complete overhaul and restructuring of GST rates has been postponed. 
given that we are headed towards the election year. Right? Next year we have national elections. Keeping that in mind, the GST council has put off the restructuring of GST rates. But definitely it has brought some clarity on pending issues, some important issues as we discussed. But now the key lies in execution. If the decisions are well implemented and executed, it will bring more clarity to the GST regime and it will simplify and bring more efficiency into the taxation regime. All right, so that is why the outcomes of the 50th GST Council meeting is very, very important. Now, let's take up the next article from page number 12 that deals with the Siachen Glacier and the Siachen dispute. And there's a very important, very interesting article on page number 12. So let's look at this topic quickly. This column has been brought out because the period of June to August marks a very, very important anniversary as far as the exploration and sovereignty of Siachen Glacier is concerned. I'm sure all of you would have heard about the Siachen Glacier. It's popularly referred to as the world's highest battlefield. It's also the world's most expensive battlefield. Right? India, Pakistan have a standing dispute at Siachen and this particular article provides us more clarity on the nature of the India-Pakistan dispute. The writer is referring to a geological survey that was conducted by the Geological Survey of India back in 1958 during the period of June to August. That is the anniversary he is referring to, the Sapphire Jubilee that he is referring to. The writer is referring to this exploration done in 1958 by the Geological Survey of India led by V.K. Raina, a top Indian geologist at that point of time. So back in 1958 from June to August, the GSI had conducted a geological exploration of the Siachen Glacier and it had even assigned a geological mapping sequence number to the Siachen Glacier. This number that you see here, 5Q13105084, it's a geological mapping sequence number that was assigned by the Geological Survey of India to the Siachen Glacier. Now, what is the importance of this? The importance of this lies in the fact that Pakistan had never disputed this geological survey that India had carried out in 1958. So, what does that mean? It means that Pakistan never saw Siachen as a disputed area until the 1980s. It was only in the 1980s that Pakistan started making unsubstantiated claims over the sovereignty of Siachen Glacier. Prior to that, Pakistan has always been silent. It has never brought up the issue. And there is evidence to point towards this. The evidence lies over here in this geological survey conducted in 1958. If Pakistan had a problem with the survey, it should have objected back then. Of course, it would have, given that the Kashmir dispute had already blown up between India and Pakistan. In 1958, when Geological Survey of India conducted a geological exploration of the Himalayas, right? an extensive survey was done in the Sikkim section of the Kumau Himalayas and also in the Kashmir Himalayas. During this survey done in 1958, Indian geologists and surveyors, they visited these sites, they set up camps, carried out exploration, right? If it was a disputed area, Pakistan would have never allowed that to happen. It would have never allowed this prolonged exploration for three months to take place at Siachen. It would have raised an objection and made it a diplomatic issue. But Pakistan never did that. It was only 25 years later from late 1970s and early 1980s. That is when Pakistan started making Siachen a, a dispute and an issue between India and Pakistan and started claiming Siachen to itself. So this expedition conducted by Indian geologists in 1958 is evidence and proof that Pakistan had no issues back in 1958 with regard to the sovereignty of Siachen. Now let me provide you some more clarity on this dispute by showing you the map of the Siachen region. You are actually looking at a very, very important map. It's a disputed map. You can see the region of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, including Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. 
Here you see the LOC, the line of control. And the northernmost point of line of control over here, which is point NJ9842. This line, the line of control that you see here, this was the ceasefire line. This was the ceasefire line that India-Pakistan had agreed to under the 1949 Karachi Agreement. Following the eruption of the Kashmir dispute and the first India-Pakistan war, when India-Pakistan took the matter to the United Nations, a ceasefire was called to end the conflict temporarily. And both sides held on to the temporary ad hoc positions that they held. And this temporary line became the ceasefire line which was recognized and codified under the Karachi Agreement of 1949. Later, in 1972, following the breakup of Pakistan and liberation of Bangladesh, through the Shimla Agreement, India-Pakistan agreed to rename the ceasefire line as line of control, as the LOC. Because India wanted to take out the role of the UN in monitoring the ceasefire. Because back in 1949 under Karachi Agreement, the United Nations has gi had given itself a role in the Kashmir dispute. Right? As UN was seen to be biased, it had given itself a role to monitor the ceasefire and set up a military observer group in India and Pakistan to monitor the ceasefire line. India was never comfortable with the role of the UN, with the role of a third party in the Kashmir dispute. That's when India also realized the mistake that had been made by taking the matter to the United Nations. But to rectify this, India got a great opportunity in 1972 when India had conclusively defeated Pakistan and liberated Bangladesh. So as we worked out the Shibla agreement, India could force itself on Pakistan and made Pakistan con agree to the renaming of ceasefire line to LOC or line of control. So that if there is no ceasefire line on paper, then what will the UN monitor? That is how UN's role was eliminated and third party involvement was put to an end as far as the Kashmir dispute is concerned. So since 1972, ceasefire line became the line of control and India-Pakistan both agreed to it. And the northernmost point has always been this point, point NJ9842. Beyond this, the demarcation has not been clear. Until 1970s, 1980s, beyond this, the demarcation was not clear and it was always presumed that Siachen Glacier, the strategic glacier that you see, this triangular area, it was presumed to belong to India. But all of a sudden, in 1970s, 1980s, Pakistan started making claims over Siachen. Now, as you can see in the map, Siachen is strategically located. To its left, you have POK, Pakistan occupied Kashmir. This is the Gilgit Baltistan region of India, which Pakistan has illegally captured from India. You can see the Shaksgam Valley, which Pakistan has gifted away to China. Shaksgam Valley also is supposed to be a part of India as part of Gilgit Baltistan. But Pakistan, after capturing it illegally, has leased it to China. So to the north of Siachen, you have Shaksgam Valley and you also have the Xinjiang province of China. Then to the right, to the east of Siachen, you have Aksai Chin, which is Indian territory illegally captured by China. China has taken control of Aksai Chin in the Ladakh region, right? And it's Indian claim territory. So in such a strategically vital region, you have the Siachen Glacier located. And naturally, it's a vantage point to dominate the important passes and locations present in this conflicted area. So traditionally, India has always presumed and claimed Siachen Glacier to be a part of Indian sovereignty. But Pakistan started suddenly disputing this in 1970s, 1980s. Prior to that, it had never expressed this concern. So by 1980s, the tensions were increasing over Siachen, as Pakistan made these claims, it started deploying troops, especially during the summer season, because at Siachen, you have extremely harsh weather. The climate, the weather is very harsh. Even the terrain, the geographical conditions are very harsh. The temperatures are minus 30, minus 40 degrees Celsius, very low oxygen uh, conditions. 
right? Soldiers can easily suffer from hypothermia, frostbite. So it's not easy to deploy troops at, at such an inhospitable location. But at least during summer season, India-Pakistan started deploying troops to enhance their claims. And India was trying to defend Siachen as Pakistan was trying to suddenly take away this region from India. Then, in 1984, India received a very valuable piece of intelligence through Research and Analysis Wing, which is India's foreign intelligence agency, that Pakistan is trying to procure Arctic warfare equipment through a European defense manufacturer. Pakistan was potentially preparing for a preemptive occupation of Siachen during the winter season when Indian troops would have retreated. But based on this valuable piece of intelligence generated by RAW, the Indian Army planned its own prevent preemptive operation called Operation Meghdoot that was authorized by then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. It's a landmark legendary military operation. It was a preemptive operation. And the most interesting fact here is that India would procure the same Arctic gear, Arctic warfare equipment from the same European defense manufacturer prior to Pakistan. And it successfully managed to carry out this preemptive operation. Before Pakistan could capture the Siachen Heights, the Indian Army successfully executed this operation to establish a permanent presence at Siachen. So since then, the region has firmly remained under Indian control, while even Pakistan has maintained a military base right at the lower levels of Siachen. So it remains a standing dispute, but one way to counter Pakistani claims is to point out the geological survey that was done in 1958. That's what the article is doing. Indian geologists had explored the area, they had camped in the area. We have ge geologically mapped out this area as well. Then Pakistan had no objections, no claims beyond point NJ9842. Even if the line had to be extended, Siachen would have fallen under Indian control. But Pakistan started claiming this area only from late 70s and early 80s, clearly showing the wrong intentions of Pakistan. Right? So that is the historical and strategic significance of this geological survey that was done in 1958 as it clearly places Siachen under India's sovereignty, under India's control. All right, That is what we take away from this important article. So with this, I complete my discussion on, on the big articles in today's paper and we head to the smaller articles which are more prelims oriented. Let's look at this article on page 1 and 14 that refers to the ongoing visit of Prime Minister Modi to France. This is a very, very important milestone in India-France relations. Prime Minister Modi is on a historic visit to France. Several important defense deals have already been announced. And right before the visit, the Defense Acquisition Council has approved the procurement of critical weapons for Indian Armed Forces. The Defense Acquisition Council has approved the procurement of additional 26 Rafale fighter jets. This is a continuation of the previous deal. Previously, India had procured around 36 Rafale fighter jets, mainly for the Indian Air Force. Right? These Rafale jets were part of a government-to-government -government deal, which involves transfer of the aircraft to India, and India has already inducted them into service and deployed them mainly against the Chinese border and also against the Pakistani border. These are frontline fighter jets, right? The previous deal of 36 Rafale jets was mainly for the Indian Air Force. But now the Indian Navy was also looking for fighter jets for its aircraft carriers. As you know, currently India is operating two aircraft carriers. We have INS Vikramaditya that we had procured from Russia. And we have INS Vikrant, the indigenously built aircraft carrier which has been recently deployed. Currently, the fighter jets being operated by Indian Navy on board these aircraft carriers are the MiG-29Ks. But these are getting old. They are getting outdated. Very soon they will have to be replaced. So, DRDO and Aeronautical Development Agency, they have launched an indigenous fighter jet development program to develop a twin-engine deck-based fighter jet that can be operated in the future through our aircraft carriers. But this is many decades away. It might take 15, 20 or even 30 years for this indigenous fighter jet to be developed, which can be operated through aircraft carriers. 
So until then, MiG-29 case will not last. They will have to be replaced. So Rafael has been chosen as the replacement. Until we develop an indigenous deck-based fighter jet for our aircraft carriers, Rafael fighter jets will be procured from France directly through a government-to-government -government deal. And 22 of these single-seat fighter jets will be used in operation on the two aircraft carriers of India. Four more would be twin-seater jets for training purposes. This would be for training the Indian Navy pilots. They would be twin-seater jets, whereas 22 would be single-seater fighter jets. Is that clear? The reason why Rafale has been chosen is because it has proven its credibility as far as aircraft carrier operations are concerned. And more importantly, Indian Air Force is already operating a similar aircraft. So in India, the essential infrastructure already exists with regard to spare parts, maintenance, etc. Right? The basic infrastructure is already being created. So instead of procuring a new aircraft, by procuring the same aircraft, we can optimize the cost and, and ensure that we are more efficient in our defense budget. So this is a historic deal that India is going to announce with France. Along with this, the Defense Acquisition Council has approved three Scorpion diesel electric submarines for the Indian Navy. Is that clear? Previously, under Project 75, India has already built six Scorpion diesel electric submarines. This involved transfer of technology where France had transferred the submarine technology to India and these six diesel electric submarines were indigenously built at the Mazgaon Dock Limited. This is under the INS Calvary class. INS Calvary class has already been inducted into the Indian Navy. All the six Scorpion diesel electric submarines they are almost completely inducted into the Indian Navy. They have been indigenously produced in India through transfer of technology from France. Now, additional contract has been approved by the Defense Acquisition Council for three more Scorpion diesel electric submarines. That is the important development. We will discuss more about India-France relations and Prime Minister's visit to France once we have more updates. Let's wait for a day or two. We will have plenty of articles regarding India-France relations. But now, I want you guys to focus on Defense Acquisition Council from a prelims point of view. There could be a factual question on Defense Acquisition Council. It is the highest level decision-making body within the Defense Ministry as far as defense procurement for our armed forces are concerned. It is headed by the Defense Minister. Defense Minister is the chairman of the Defense Acquisition Council. It also includes the CDS, the newly created Chief of Defense Staff, along with the respective Chiefs of all the three armed forces. Is that clear? This council was set up following the recommendations of group of ministers that was headed by then Deputy Prime Minister L.K. Advani, which was set up to restructure India's national security following the failures that led to the Kargil War of 1999. Right now, we are in an important anniversary week. On 14 July in 1999, India declared victory over Pakistan in the Kargil conflict. And by 26 July, we formally declared the victory and that is why we mark Vijay Divas that marks the end of the Kargil war. But Kargil war in itself brought out many shortcomings, deficiencies and mistakes on the Indian side. There was an intelligence failure, failure on the armed forces, failure on part of the Vajpayee government which had prevent, failed to prevent the incursion in the first place. So to revo reform our national security following the Kargil war and identify the deficiencies, there were some important committees that were set up. One was the Kargil Review Committee, the KRC, headed by Dr. Subramanyam, Dr. K. Subramanyam. He was a top IAS officer, a strategic expert. Under his chairmanship, the Kargil Review Committee was constituted. Dr. Subramaniam was none other than the father of current foreign minister, Dr. Jai Shankar. So Dr. Subramaniam headed the Kargil Review Committee and came out with several recommendations to reform India's external and internal security. It led to wide sweeping changes in our border security, in our defense preparedness, also in our internal security and intelligence reforms as well. Parallelly, there was a committee of ministers 
called GOM, Group of Ministers, that was constituted by the Vajpayee government, headed by then Deputy Prime Minister L.K. Advani. The GOM also came out with some, some important recommendations and one of them was to establish a Defence Acquisition Council headed by the Defence Minister comprising of all the service chiefs so that it could become the highest decision-making body as far as defence procurement is concerned. So today all purchases, all defence procurement, all projects have to be approved and cleared by the Defence Acquisition Council. That is its role, that, that is the function of the Defence Acquisition Council. Next, on page number 2 and page number 11, we have two very important images. As you know, North India is reeling under the impact of floods. The Delhi NCR region is being threatened by the Yamuna River, which has already breached the danger mark. And in Himachal Pradesh, the Bias River, particularly in the Kulu Valley and downstream in Punjab region as well, has been flooding over the last few days causing immense destruction there has been loss of life loss of property right essentially it has turned into a major disaster in northern india so that's why i feel that you should be familiar with the geography of both the rivers the course of both yamuna and the bs river from a prelims point of view let's quickly look at this in this map you're looking at the course of the yamuna please pay attention Yamuna is a major tributary of the Ganga River. It has its origin at the Yamunotri Glacier over here in Uttarakhand at the Bandar Pooch Peaks in the lower Himalayas of the Mussoorie Range. Alright, in the Uttarkashi district of Uttarakhand, that is where the Yamuna River takes birth and flows down into Delhi NCR region, into Uttar Pradesh and other parts that are listed over here. It also flows through parts of Himachal and Haryana as well, with a total length of 1,376 kilometers. The major dam projects on Yamuna include the Lakwar Vyasi Dam in Uttarakhand, Tajawal Barrage Dam in Haryana, etc. And the major tributaries are Chambal, Sindh, Betwa and Ken. Please make a note and also pay attention to the massive pollution of the Yamuna in the industrial belt of Delhi NCR region, right? Yamuna is known to constantly froth. It's known for its chemical contamination. It's a highly polluted water body as well. And now the river is flooding, causing extensive damage in the northern parts of India. So being familiar with the course and geography of the river is very important. The essential facts is very important for your prelims. Coming to the BS River, the Bias is a very, very important tributary and a river of the Indus Basin. It's not from the Gangetic Basin. It's part of the Indus Basin. The Indus Drainage Basin comprises of Indus, Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, Bias and Satluj. These are the six rivers of the Indus Drainage Basin. This is something we share with Pakistan. Alright? The Bias River is entirely within India. Please make a note. The BS River originates near the Rotang Pass in Himachal Pradesh and it flows through Himachal into Punjab. It's one of the five major rivers that drains Punjab, that gives Punjab the name, right? It's the land of five rivers. The BS River merges with the Satlaj at a place known as Harike in Punjab. At Harike, the BS River merges with Satlaj and further flows into Pakistan where it merges with the Chenab and further with the larger Indus Basin. Is that clear? So the Bias River forms the Kulu Manali Valley in Himachal Pradesh. It flows completely within India as it merges with Satluj and then enters Pakistan to merge with Chenab. It's part of the Indus Water Treaty which is a water sharing treaty between India and Pakistan. Since BS is an eastern river, along with Ravi and Satluj, India has greater control over the eastern rivers, according to Indus Water Treaty. Understood? So BS is a lifeline for Himachal Pradesh and Punjab. That's what you need to note down. Now coming to the last article for today, we have an article on page 16 related to Chandrayaan-3 mission. In a few hours, ISRO is going to attempt a very ambitious mission 
to launch Chandrayaan-3 into the right orbit and further take it towards the lunar orbit. In this entire mission, one of the centers of ISRO, the VSSC, Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, plays a critical role in the Chandrayaan-3 mission. In fact, in almost every space launch, VSSC plays a critical role as it is the lead center of ISRO to develop, design, launch vehicles, including your PSLV, GSLV and the launch vehicle Mark III, which is currently going to lift off Chandrayaan-3 mission. All right, VSSC has played a phenomenal role in, in India's space program. It is located at Tumba, at the Tumba Equatorial Station near Tiruvananthapuram in Kerala. Since 1960s, it has been the lead center in our space program. This is where India's initial space scientists led by Dr. Vikram Sarabhai launched sounding rockets into the equatorial orbit to conduct basic scientific experiments that marked the beginning of India's space program. That's why the center is named after Dr. Vikram Sarabhai in his honor. This center is the lead center to design and develop the launch vehicles of ISRO and in Chandrayaan-3 mission, it's going to play a critical role to carry out a safety check, a system check through the virtual control center that is present at VSSC. So the launch takes place at Srihari Kota, right, which is an island, uh, a small island off the coast of uh, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu in the Bay of Bengal. So the main launch center is located at Srihari Kota. Before the launch sequence is initiated, a complete system check is done to ensure that there are no uh, possibility of failures. During the COVID-19 pandemic, since movement and human contact had to be minimized, ISRO set up a remote control center in VSSC at Tiruvananthapuram. Instead of moving the scientists to Sri Kota before a launch to carry out a system check, a virtual launch center was created in VSSC from where scientists can remotely check out the systems in the launch sequence and then finally go ahead with the actual launch. So in the countdown to Chandrayaan-3 mission at VSSC Tiruvananthapuram, all the concerned system checks will be carried out through the virtual launch center. So these are some basic facts with regard to India's space program, which could be important for your prelims. With this, I complete my analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. Of course, there are a few more articles, but these are the most important articles as far as today's paper is concerned. I hope you guys have understood all the articles. Now, please take up these questions for your answer writing practice. Write the answers and post them in the answer writing portal for which link is given in the description box below. Also, head to the Telegram channel. We have a quiz on some of these topics. It will help you revise these topics again. All right. So if you like the initiative, if you like this video, just support us by pressing that like button. That means the world to us. Share your comments, share it with other aspirants as well. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So that is it for today. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.